to prescribe the opioids to the same degree and the same dose as they are. So they have one of two choices. Come down and off the opioids the good old-fashioned way by tapering the dose, suffering some side effects from withdrawal, or placing the pump. And typically, my protocol, and this is not published, and this is absolutely not supported by literature, so my non-randomized, non-placebo-controlled study of my own opinion is that I cut the dose in half at the time of the trial, I cut it in half again by the time the pump is implanted. So physiologically, there's no amount of opioid that you can throw at your liver that it can't handle, right? Your liver is a very, very impressive organ. The cytochrome P450, that thing revs up. You have smooth endoplasmic reticulum to the here, to the sun and back, right? These people, you give them, uh, and I had a, a patient that it was on about 800 milligram equivalents. So you got to cut your dose in half. He did, cut it down to 400. I gave him five milligrams of intrathecal morphine, bolus dose, all at once. No, it didn't kill him because I use a 1 to 100 ratio. It gave him about five or six hours of really good pain relief. Pain was back. So the pump fails when you combine orals and patches with the pump. It's not designed to do that because if, you take, uh, if you're taking 60 milligram OxyContin like their like they're sweet tarts and your liver, it's being showered, 80% of the blood volume is coming through the portal venous system right at your liver, and it's, it is hyper metabolic, it's metabolizing this stuff. So the point is, is you can't combine intrathecal drug therapy with any significant success as long as you're giving, uh, if, if you are giving patients, in addition to that, oral or transdermal narcotic. will short circuit your success. Well, this is primarily the patients that we face now. That we, we, we get these in droves. Last year I did over 100 pumps. Probably out of those, 80% uh, of them were these patients are trying to get down and off oral narcotics. So we have different delivery systems. We take them orally. We take them intravenously. We can take them transdermally. And the ratio, published ratio of oral milligrams of morphine compared to intrathecal drug delivery is between 1 to 2 to 300. Right? So one milligram of intrathecal morphine is equivalent to about two to 300 by mouth. That's published. My experience is it's more like one to 100. So I encourage you to use what's published, but I do want to pass that on in terms of uh, common experience. Because the people that do most of these, I think Lisa Stearns, Eric Grigsby, and people around the country that do lots of this probably agree with the one to 100 more. And so it's up to us now. It's our responsibility to publish this. This is level one data, and this is why we do this. And so if we look at things that are important, pain relief, which is the only reason patients should be taking the oral narcotics, we look at mortality, which is all the way on your right, and we look at toxicity, this is, uh, this is data, level one data from Peter Stotts and uh, T.D.A. Smith showing you that this is better at pain reduction. Patients have lower rates of mortality and patients have lower rates of side effects and toxicity when taken intrathecally as compared with orally. This is cost effectiveness, and I really liked, uh, I really liked the graph that was shown previously about the comparison of neuromodulation in terms of cost between that and medication management. And so this is Lisa Stearns' article right here, and this shows the comparison and this is a high-dose, high-cost regimen, meaning things like OxyContin, Cadian, uh, things are more expensive, Nucenta, and versus the targeted drug delivery that's very flat. And these cross over at about seven to eight months. So even though it's expensive to place the pump, even though the pump costs a certain amount in and of itself, it's expensive medical device, piece of equipment, even though it's any time you go in the hospital for a day or two, you run up costs, the cost of medication is very high. I don't know if you've had this experience, but next time you talk to patients that are on medications like this that I just mentioned previously, especially the long actings or some of the more some of the more commons, I mean even oxy IR, oxycontin, ask them how much it cost. Uh, I am absolutely blown away about how expensive some of these medications are. So the the comparison of a high cost is between seven to eight months. And essentially everybody I'm in planning now 
fits into the high cost because these are people on the average when they come to see me before they start tapering down the first time are about on the average three to 500 milligram equivalents of morphine daily, which again is shocking. But you know, I, I suppose that I don't live in the only area in the United States that this happens. And my guess is that although the people don't like to talk about it, this is probably happening all over the country. And so for, for this, we talk about people that place pumps and I'm an interventional radiologist, and this is a slide that is designed uh, primarily to show our two radiologists here. So really focus on that. So we have hardly anybody. We've got about four to five guys, IRs in the country, placing these things out of, you know, you go to the Society of Interventional Radiology, there's 8,000 people there. It's an international meeting, yes, but so you do the diagnosis, the biopsy, you do the ports for chemotherapy, you do the radio embolizations, the Y90s, the TACE, you do the ablations, uh, but we don't do the thing that's most effective in terms of controlling the pain primarily. And so there's a definite gap, and a lot of you guys have a lot of experience in this. And so I'm trying to do for the interventional radiologist what we're trying to do for you in terms of pump and augmentation to really polish it off so you, you have a full armamentarium of, of things that you can use with your patients other arrows in your quiver. And this is designed to show the deficiency that we typically have. This is like a big port is what this is. It's put in the same way. And every time I show somebody new this that comes from the IR, INR background, they say, oh, it's like a big port. Absolutely. And it's kind of put in like this. It's put in with an incision on the left or right lower quadrant. And it's about a seven centimeter incision halfway between the ribs margin and the iliac crest, and it's placed here in the mid-axillary line, right here, seven centimeter incision. Incision about like this on the front and about like this on the back, and the catheter insertion goes in. You anchor it with an anchor. You suture it down, tunnel it to the front, and place the pump in the, this area here. Is it always placed here? No, you can place it in the back, although the pump, especially the 40 cc thicker pump is very uncomfortable. I place it back here only in p patients that are quite fluffy. Uh, sometimes in patients that are extremely fluffy, I've even put it pectoral, but that's an unusual place. But the standard place is either the right or left lower quadrant mid clavicular line. And let's talk a little bit about some of the components of management reimbursement. Uh, the people don't often discuss things like this, but I like to because in, uh, I have a private practice and it has to be sustainable. So one of the things about pumps is it's a little bit different and a little bit arcane and esoteric and sometimes uh, facilities and systems gives you pushback. And so these are the two things that are on label that go in the pump, either morphine, infumorph, or prealt, zaconitide. And this is managed, this is the Medtronic system. So uh, I will update this with the Flowonic system, but this is what I have currently. And so the Neurovision controller, the patient uh, therapy manager, and the uh, new ascended catheter, this is braided catheter, definitely an improvement over the previous Cytelastic, and the refill kit. And so this is how we program the pump. This is how the patient gives them uh, additional adjustments in terms of the patient therapy manager. Typically, I will set somebody on a baseline dose, and I will give them four to five bolus doses, and uh, just a common thing. Patients will come in, 300 milligram equivalents of morphine. We do a, a three milligram bolus dose as a test. They get good pain relief. They come back in. I start them off at about 1 to 1 1.3 or 4 milligrams daily of, let's say, morphine, common medication. Give them five 0 0.2 milligram bolus doses allowed to raise that one milligram. And we see what the utilization is in about seven or eight days, and we'll kind of raise it up and we'll do this until they get to a point, a combination of the, the least effective way to control the least amount of medication to effectively control their pain, and this is how we do this. This is widely covered uh, and widely reimbursed. This is a typical reimbursement sheet with the coding. And so for you guys who do comprehensive pain, I want to show you this. So this is these terrible screenshots are taken from my iPhone, and this is our EMR. 
we use Intellidox. It's just a garden variety EMR. So, you know, I, I picked representative patients that were injection patients. I picked patients that were kyphoplasty or augmentation patients. I picked patients that were neuromodulation patients. And I picked patients that were targeted drug delivery patients. And I looked into the reimbursement data, and I'm going to show you the differences, and I think you'll be a little bit surprised. I was the reason I did this is because I figured I would get the results that you will see toward the end of this slide series, but I was a little bit surprised by even what the difference was. So discogenic back pain, uh, the number of procedures, three in the little column, you can see it there. And this is sometimes you do, I will do epidural injections even though they don't do very well at all for discogenic back pain. We'll follow that with a therapeutic disc injection. Sometimes we use we have patients on stem cell trials. But in general, the number of procedures, three. Kyphoplasty patient, number of procedures, five. Lumbar spinal anesthesis, kind of maintain them with epidural injections or whatever injections will, will, will help them, combination of physical therapy, number of procedures, 11. Dorsal comp stimulation, you combine the implant with adjustment of the neuromodulator, you adjust them, you see them back, uh, number of procedures 25. DCS patients, number of procedures 61, a little bit difficult to ingest, you see them back, battery change, maybe a lead fails or something. ITB, intratecal back of one patient, 179 procedures, not only the implantation, but the adjustment, the refills, adjust the bolus dose anytime you see them back, counts. Cancer pain, 184. This is more of a chronic type bone metastatic disease and somebody in this patient uh, specifically had prostate cancer. Failed low back surgery, number of procedures, 217. And so these are what you get reimbursed, trigger point injections, ESIs, the the selective nerve root blocks, the facet injections, and RFAs. This is common. This is Medicare data, and this is kind of what you get reimbursed, and we verified this through our Medicare carrier, which is Novitas, and th these are accurate numbers. Here's what you get placed for a dorsal column stimulator. So implant, leads, uh, electronic analysis, which is what I was referring to previously, and a laminectomy leads. This is implantation of a pump, pump catheter, pump itself, analysis and reprogramming, refills, pump refills, 117. And this is a comparison. So this is a comparison between common maximized injection procedures, three epidural injections a year, facet injections, a couple rate of frequency rhizotomies, as compared with uh, neuromodulation. So year one, depending on how you put it in, whether it's percutaneous leads, laminectomy leads, it can be a reimbursement, 983 to 1413 with reprogramming uh, years two through 10, $172 a year. And notice that the uh, iPhones only came out when the reimbursement slides went up. Everybody notice that? So here's comparing it to pumps. So we have on the average, even at best with our phase, you have between four and $500 a year. Year one for a pump, $1,673, years two through seven, because pumps uh, only last seven years, $849 per patient per year comparatively. And the difference between column on the left and the column on the right is the column on the left, these are patients you're doing something. In our program, we have uh, nurse refills. We have catheter and rotor studies done by the nurse who has uh, been a, uh, I've worked with for decades, and he's better than anybody technically that I know, including physicians. And we have them come through, and the clinic runs. The patients, I'm right there, and it only runs when I'm there. And they're refilled, they're analyzed, the doses are adjusted. If there's a question about whether the catheter or the pump are somehow it's not working, it's not working, okay, catheter and rotor study, question always come back to me for dose adjustment and anything else. And this continues to run at this rate per year, Per patient, we have 370 some pump patients. So you can do the math on that. So reprogramming and electronic analysis. And so hopefully I've given you a good broad brush stroke of kind of the current pump patients, what we've done, what we see, what we're seeing more of now. 
uh, I encourage you to incorporate this into your practice. As I mentioned at the outset, these patients, very difficult patients, the severe spasticity, the uh, adult deformity patients that are not surgical candidates, failed low back surgery that are not treated adequately with neuromodulation, patients with cancer pain, metastatic disease, uh, high opioid use, great hundreds of milligrams equivalents of morphine. I don't know how you would manage these segments of patients without targeted drug delivery. And I got into this because I felt I had to. I didn't learn this in residency. I did not learn it in fellowship. I learned it after the fact because of the necessity. And I think if you have the advantage to take, it, take advantage of all the training and experience of your faculty to incorporate this into your practice, I think you'll find it very rewarding. It's one of these things that you have to put guardrails on it. You have to be very strict about certain things you do, especially with the opioid patients. But if you do that, you follow the guidelines and you're very strict about it, I think you'll find this is one of the most rewarding things we'll do in medicine. Appreciate it, guys. Questions, comments?